Interestingly, George Martin featured horses so prominently in the Song of Ice and Fire because he thought there was no chance of a television adaptation ever being produced. Oh, how the turns have tabled. So then let's look at all these horses and their variants in Aesop. With Martin's unbridled use of these steeds within his story, what can we learn, what can we glean, and what will impact the winds of winter? But first, please subscribe if you can. My channel is super small at under 500 subscribers, so even one sub provides a massive boost to the channel. Thank you all very much. Horses are significant to our story in many ways. Cavalry are integral parts of land battles, frequently used for transportation, and cultures such as the Dorthraki have spiritual ties with their steeds. There are six listed breeds of horses throughout the song, and they are based somewhat on real-world counterparts, at least medieval historical accounts. The most valuable and well-bred horses are Destrers, which are well-bred and massive war horses made for war and wild at heart. During battle they will kick and bite, killing men even without their mounts. These powerful beasts are typically only used by the nobility and those who can afford them, as they are very expensive. Coursers are also used in combat, and while not as strong or powerful, they are nearly as large and slightly faster than Destrers, and they are most commonly used in battle as the most common war horse we see in the song. Chargers are another breed of war horses, inferior to both previous breeds, but still quite fast. The last war horse breed are the Roundsies, which are poor quality war horses we see used only by those who cannot afford the first three, as these horses are shorter and while strong, better suited as pack animals than beasts of war. Palfreys are the horse breed used as pack animals and for basic transportation, not suitable for combat and instead better equipped for endurance. Garons are the only breed we see used beyond the wall, where they are uniquely adapted as beasts of the cold. Sand steeds are interesting, as these are either a subspecies of horse or possibly even a different species of equine. These wild horses of Dorne are smaller and weaker than regular horses, but much faster. They can ride quickly for a moderate amount of time, and integrated well into Dornish culture and hit-and-run battle tactics. There are also a few hybrid horse breeds we see throughout Planetos. Mules are obviously present, the cross between a horse and a donkey, but so are Zorsets, the cross between a zebra and a horse, though interestingly we never see zebras in the song. Zorsets are actually present in our real world, though they are more commonly called zebroids and not reliable mounts. However, the Zorsets of the song appear to be more powerful and formidable beasts of war, and we see them all throughout Planetos. Balon Swan even uses one as his mount. Both zebroids and mules are sterile, but the frequency of Zorsets in Aeswaf either means that Zorsets are not sterile in the song, which isn't a massive leap, given how Zorsets are different from real-world zebroids, and how zebras are seemingly absent from Aeswaf. The other possibility is that Zorsets are sterile like mules, but there is an industry of Zors breeders, likely in Essos, that distributes Zorsets throughout Planetos. It's funny to think that there might be a Zors merchant somewhere. On top of the ubiquitous appearances of horses in their various breeds, we get specific instances of special named horses, or even horses so fascinating they could be considered their own characters. We see Ramsey's horse Blood, whose personality matches his master. Both are incredibly bad and horrible, just like the spelling of my scripts. This link and tie is quite interesting, and while I'm not trying to say that Ramsey is a horse warg, it's fascinating how often animal companions match the personalities and mindsets of their human owners in Aeswaf, such as Ramsey and his dogs. Also mentioned are Jamie's horses Glory and Honor, Arya's horse Craven, Bran's ironically named horse Dancer, which he rides after being crippled, Rohane Weber's horse Flame, who is part Dornish Sandsteed, Duncan's horse Thunder, Egg's horse Rain, Osney's horse Midnight, and of course, Daenerys's Silver. Also notable is Tyrek Lannister, who according to this quote is totally now a horse. You go Tyrek. However, the most notable horse is Stranger, also known as Driftwood, the horse of Sandra Clegane. His name and behavior are both interesting, his name being a blasphemous mock of the Seven's God of Death. He is legendarily difficult to control, for everyone except for the Hound himself, and this deep bond is oddly touching and unique within the song. Stranger's presence, at the Quiet Isle in A Feast for Crows, therefore, 
heavily implies that Sandor Clegane himself must have been there to have led the horse through the difficult bog that is required to navigate through to get to the isle. We even get a grave digger who matches Sandor's description and in injuries, and this man leans to pet a hound as Brienne passes. Another horse that is a cornerstone to many theories is the horse the Knight of the Laughing Tree rode, as well as the horses tied with Lyanna Stark. Lyanna Stark was described as being an astonishingly outstanding rider, some even praising her as being half horse. Many theorize, therefore, that she was a horse warg, but this is heavily unlikely, as wargs are exceedingly rare, not all Starks are wargs, and the newest generation of Starks being wargs is an anomaly due to the resurgence of magic. Likely she was just a really good horseback rider for other reasons. So what about the Knight of the Lapping Tree? This mystery knight performed very well at the tourney of Harrenhal, choosing to unseat three knights whose squires had assaulted Howland Reed to defend the Cranach Bent's honor. We know very little, and we can be sure of even less, as the accounts of the knights stem exclusively from word of mouth. Now many people jump to conclusions and say Lyanna must be the Knight of the Laughing Tree, so let's look at this theory. The ties to horses are very strong, as the Knight of the Laughing Tree would need to be a proficient rider, which Lyanna undoubtedly is. The Knight of the Laughing Tree is also remarkably short, which Lyanna was at the time. The Knight of the Laughing Tree was also tied to Howland Reed, and the only people at the tourney tied to the Reeds at the time were the four Stark siblings. Other than these two bits of evidence and one minor connection, that's all we have, though. In fact, Lyanna being the Knight of the Laughing Tree, while possible, has some pretty big holes. Namely, how could a 14-year-old girl become a world-level jouster overnight, and can speak in such a booming voice? So who is the Knight of the Laughing Tree? I would say we can't be sure yet, and Lyanna is certainly still a possibility, but personally I believe that the Knight of the Laughing Tree is Bran Stark, the very same tree boy from our song. The Knight of the Laughing Tree was short, proficient, and chose to represent himself with a weirwood in whatever armor he could find. Bran is heavily tied to weirwoods, and has always dreamed of being a knight. If Bran became some ultimate tree god and could do whatever he wanted, I think being a knight in a tournament would be first on the kid's bucket list, and what better tourney to choose than the wonderful tourney of old his two best friends keep telling him about. If we have already seen that, through weirwoods, Bran can interact with the past. Weirwoods experience time non-linearly, and the descriptions we get of warging makes it seem like there isn't really a singular temporal reference point, at least when using weirwoods. The idea that Bran could warg something or someone in the past isn't too far-fetched, but still admittedly the weakest part of this theory. Bran also has had character development linked with horse riding already, through the saddle Tyrion designed for him, and his selectability to ride regardless of his crippled legs. So what other supernatural horses do we see in the song? Let's look back at the Dorthraki. Drogo's horse is quite interesting, as its death was brutally used in a blood magic ritual by Miri Mazdur to extend Drogo's life. Drogo then remains in a vegetative state, and many theorize that the mind or soul of Drogo's horse was placed in Drogo's body, which honestly seems to be the case, if ultimately irrelevant to the narrative. The close ties Dorthraki have with their horses doesn't seem to be supernatural otherwise, because if we ignore this unique case of blood magic, there's no other evidence to point to anything we haven't already seen in our own history with races such as the Mongols or the Cherokee. However, the Dorthraki have all based their religion around a singular great horse, because of course they do. We know next to nothing about this great horse religion, but it does interestingly seem to be worshipped elsewhere throughout Essos, not just by the Dorthraki. Perhaps this religion carries some truth then, like Relorism or the God of Death, or merely it's a social construct like the Seven. But regardless, it bears keeping in mind, as we'll see a lot more of the Dothraki in the Winds of Winter. Supernatural horses remain a fascinating concept, and we surprisingly have many other accounts of such horses throughout our story. The tall men used blood-red horses to pull their chariots, though they were all killed by the Dorthraki. The others are supposed to have rode pale white horses, which is a real-world symbolism and personification of death, making me think this story choice was deliberate, as it is oddly fitting. Patchface speaks of seahorses in a way that suggests that they are great beasts that may be ridden. They also appear on the sigil of House Valerian. These three mythical horse variants are not mentioned many times, 
but they are established as having symbolic and real meaning in the song, so their ultimate inclusion in the story is not impossible. But what about unicorns? Well, I already have a video on unicorns, so go watch it. But to summarize, unicorns are certifiably real in Aeswath and present on Skagos and Ib, but resemble massive and dangerous goats with long shaggy hair, not majestic horses. That said, several houses in Westeros use the device of a unicorn on their coat of arms, and this sigil uses the horse-based unicorn, as opposed to the goat variant. Perhaps then there are horse unicorns? Probably not, but it's fun to dream. Centaurs are also supposedly present in our song, massive half-horse, half-human hybrids, even used on the coat of arms of House Casewell. These centaurs allegedly occupied the eastern areas of the Dorthraki Sea during the Dawn Age, but many in-universe believe that these are inflated tales of mounted warriors. However, we do hear occasional accounts of centaur skeletons, so who knows? If they were real, they are almost certainly extinct now, thousands of years later, but we really can't be sure. Magic is coming back into the story, and the dragons, the others, and krakens were all thought to be dead, but now have returned. But what about these dragons, others, krakens, unicorns, fire lions, and other mythical beasts of Aeswath? Well, you're going to have to check out this playlist I've got pulled up on screen now, which has come to a conclusion with this video. That's right, this video is last in a series on cryptids and mythological beasts and animals in Aeswath, as well as their coming impact in our story and the systems of magic that they purvey. That said, this channel is super tiny at under 500 subscribers, so if you have comments, feedback, or video ideas, I will read them and take them into account. I love to hear from you all, and even one channel interaction really boosts the channel by a significant amount because of the small size and the scope of these videos. But hey, thank you very much for watching to the end. Do take care, and I will see you all next time.